let's uh, let's look at it. You know, a couple of weeks ago, uh, we did an entire serve. Uh, series on a church survey that happened that said that there were 12 lies that the modern American church believed. And we went through them pretty briefly and just covering the 12 and giving you verses that would help support the traditional church view, the traditional Christian message that, uh, I don't know, it's been good for over 2,000 years, probably going to last another couple of years, you know. Correct. Whether this generation of young people want to believe it or not really is irrelevant. Correct. Uh, God is not going to be put to sleep. He's not going to be put down. He's not a puppy that nobody wants at the, at the uh, uh, Humane Society. He is going to survive this. But we might as well go out with it on our lips rather than the lies. Amen? And so uh, one of the lies that we saw was the prosperity gospel. We spoke about the biblical view of the prosperity gospel. Okay, God will always reward true faith with material blessings. We just saw that was not biblical. Nope. That was not biblical. And so that message is available uh, on, our, on our YouTube channel if you want to see the biblical view of what is prosperity. Because I'm here to tell you, God wants to bless you. He does. Yes, but it's always, but we always finish that with, but His ways are not our ways. Right. Sometimes His blessing is not what we would consider a blessing, but it is an end. How many times have we looked back and thank God that our prayers were not answered? Yes. Amen. Lord. We've looked back and His ways are a lot smarter than our ways. And so we, do, we address that. Now line number six is what we're addressing now. And that is the evangelical church believe that the Holy Spirit is a force that is not equal with God. And this again comes from a couple of different areas. One I think is Star Wars. The force be with you. You know, the d Luke, the force is in you. You know, kind of thing. And nobody's a bigger Star Wars fan than your pastor. He loves Star Wars. Every Christmas, my kids give me some kind of a Yoda gift, okay? I don't know if they think I look like Yoda or I'm wise like Yoda. <laughs> And, you, and, and if you're polite, you're not going to answer that, okay? <laughs> it does, does he look like it or not? But I, in my office at the uh, school, I've got an entire table of Yoda dolls and action figures and bobbleheads and nutcrackers and stuff they've given me through the years. Absolutely love the, the movie, but it's not a theology, okay? Also, one of the most ancient, one of the very most ancient beliefs on our, in our entire world is something called animism. Animism is a theological belief that the God force inhabits everything. The, the forest is, a, is an essence of God. And, and the Native Americans, an ancient man, said, you know, that, that we are all one with nature. And that nature is us and we are it. And a part of the whole uh, ecological, uh, we're killing the world, and the whole global warming movement is a part of the animist movement. It is a part of a pagan, Wiccan movement, an ancient pagan movement that uh, says that, that um, because we are one with the planet, we're responsible for that planet. Now, I'm responsible for the planet because God made me responsible for it. He said, this world is under your dominion. Take care of it. That's correct. Okay? That's correct. He said that. But, uh, but if you believe in animism, then you're going to come up with all kinds of counterfeit ideas and stuff like that. Uh, when I was in New Guinea, the people put it this way. They said, uh, we, we went to war with those people. I said, why, why was the last time you had cannibalism? And uh, the tribe I was with was a former cannibal tribe. And, but they only ate people that they went to battle with. They had to go to war with them. So I know you're thinking that Pillsbury Doughboy from Oklahoma is looking pretty good in a pot right now. Okay, that, that, that pastor, he'd be really good with a carrot in his mouth. Uh, but I knew I was safe because they only eat people that they fight in battle. And I was not going to go to war with anybody, okay? So, but I asked him, I asked him about cannibalism. I asked him about the belief of cannibalism. And they said, do you not believe that the spirit dwells in everything from the rocks to the trees to the frogs to the water to the people that we defeat in battle. So when I eat that person, I take their spirit into me. I take their strength. I eat their arms so that I can be strong. I eat their legs so that I can be fast. I eat their brains so that I can have their thoughts. And the whole animistic thought, you know, of this whole thing. Now, you know, it kind of turns our stomach, but just, just know that Arms, legs, and torsos were put in a smoke shack and smoked until they were almost beef jerky and then eaten as a smoked delicacy. The brain was boiled and put into a stew. Uh, again, kind of, that's how they did it. But the, the whole idea was to get that spirit within them, that life force of this planet within them. 
And so uh, when I asked them what, what was the last time they did that, they said, those people were taking fish out of our stream. They had their own streams. And every fish that they took out of our stream was taking part of our life away. Now they didn't mean physical life, they meant a spiritual life. That every fish spirit taken away was taken away from their spirit. And one of the elders looked me right in the face and he said, let them go take care of their own frogs. Our frogs are ours to take care of because they're like our children. And I said, the frogs are like your children? He said, we're all one in this world. We're all one. Now, we are one when it comes to humans. I, I don't believe, I, I just, I don't believe that uh, the division that we make artificially about races and ethnicity, I think Christians should be colorblind. I really do. I think we ought to be colorblind. Now, are, are, are there groups of people in our society that tick me off the way they behave? Yeah, but they come in every color, <laughs> you know. They come in every color, folks. They, they tick me off, and they're not doing biblical things, and they're not doing things that are good for themselves or for others. But uh, are there groups of color that seem to do things more than others? Yeah, yeah. They're, they're things that white people tick me off like no, no end, okay? But we ought to be colorblind in that area. Because we're supposed to be people that Jesus sees them. And so that whole one spirit in the world, yes, I believe that we're one spirit in the world as far as one family and one tribe of people that Jesus came to die and to redeem. Yes. And if he found them worthy, then I have to find them worthy. Yes. Now, did Jesus agree with everything that I ever did? No. No, he didn't. Did he die for me? Yes, he did. Yes, he did. All right. So, do I have to agree with everything that they do and say for me to still pray for them and get them the gospel? No. no. And the older I get, the easier it is for me to segregate people and to think things about people. It seems like it's easier and easier and easier for me to be judgmental about people. But that doesn't make it right. Correct. It doesn't make it right. Correct. It's one of those strongholds and one of those speculations that we need to cast down. And we need to keep the colorblind attitude, okay? Um, but anyway, getting back to where we were, the Holy Spirit is not a person but a force. 56% of the American population said that, and 51% of the evangelical church said that in this survey. So we are talking then about the person of the Holy Spirit. The person of the Holy Spirit. We have this uh, uh, illustration that we use where this is water, this is water, and this is water, but it's water in three different forms. And in the natural world, we can see this in many, many areas where we can look at things that are the same, but different manifestations of the same thing. When we look at it in the spiritual realm, we say that liquid water is not uh, solid ice. Solid ice is not gas and steam. Gas and steam is not liquid water. But liquid water is water, solid is water, and steam is water. So they're all the same. If we take that and put it into the supernatural, then we see the same chart where the Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is not the Father. But all of them are God. They're different representations of the same God. Three in one. That there is one who manifests, manifests himself in three different ways. One of the biggest hang-ups that the Muslims have with Christianity is that they see us as polytheistic. They see us as worshiping three gods. That worshiping Jesus as a god is to create a second god. But if we ask them the same kind of thing about water, it's like they say, oh, oh. Well, I still hate you because you're polytheistic. And you say, no. Am I worshiping water or am I worshiping water? And they just, you know, they kind of hit a wall there. They hit a logical wall where they can't go any farther. And I've, I've spoken to Muslims about this. I've shared with Muslims, especially in my collegiate days, my early ministry days. Um, and it, we just hit a wall there. Their, their mind just couldn't jump the fence. And so I had to leave them to the Holy Spirit to do that, right? So the person of the Holy Spirit. We, we looked last week at the Holy Spirit teaches and reminds people. He speaks. He makes decisions. The Holy Spirit can be grieved. He can be outraged and insulted. He can be lied to. These are things that happen to persons, to people. This is not a force. This is a, uh, an entity. This is a presence, a person. Number seven, we said, can forbid or prevent human speech and plans. We looked at 
verses about that. Number eight, he searches everything and, con and con comprehends God's thoughts. And we touched briefly on the ninth, distributing gifts, and that he distributes gifts as he will. And so this is the person of the Holy Spirit. Now remember, before we jump into number 10, which is where we left off, the Old Testament... Testament meaning covenant, meaning agreement, meaning will and testament. This is the contract that God made with man. Was that if you will do these things, if you will sacrifice, if you will have the holy days, if you will have the Ark of the Covenant, if you will keep my law, then I will come and I will visit you and I will be among you. You will be my people and I will be your God. That was the Old Testament, but it was very conditional. It was conditional. Now, man broke his side. God never broke his side. God never left the Jews, no matter what they did. He was constantly wooing and calling them back in the Old Testament, constantly giving them the 2,000th choice, a chance, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, my God is not a God of second chances. My God is a God of a million billion second chances, okay? And thank God that He is. Thank God. Thank God that He is. But He continued in the Old Testament to do that. Now, when Jesus came, Jesus was continuing the Old Testament message. He was the physical manifestation of God. He was the physical presence of God, but it was a temporary visit. It was temporary, just like the rest of the Old Testament. So the Gospels really ought to be over in the Old Testament, okay? Because they're a part of the Old Agreement. It was not until the day of Pentecost when the Spirit of God was released to indwell us, that there's a new sheriff in town. There's a new agreement. There's a new law. There's a new testament. Now the testament is that the Holy Spirit, the presence of God, does not visit man, but He dwells in man. He inhabits man. And that this is an eternal habitation. Okay? So that even if I break the covenant, He doesn't go away, but He stays there. Are there prices to be paid for breaking the covenant? Of course there are. There are natural consequences to breaking the law. Again, gravity is a law you do not want to try and break. Correct. You know, you don't get on the 30th floor and say, I'm a Christian, gravity doesn't work on me. You, it won't work for 29 floors, but that 30th floor is going to be a rude awakening, okay? That last one's going to be a, stop, a very abrupt stop. So anyway, this is what we're talking about. This, this, this presence of God that is now within us. That is in us. And that is the New Testament. Yeah. All right, that's the New Testament. That's the Holy Spirit. And that's the difference between the Old Testament Holy Spirit and the New Testament Holy Spirit. He's saying yesterday and forever. Right. It's His dwelling and abiding place that's different. He's come to dwell within man. Okay, so with that in mind then, we look at the, the tenth thing that we ended with. We kind of read it and then ran out of time. So let's, let's start again, okay? The Spirit helps intercedes, and actually has a mind. And for that we look at Romans 8. Romans 8. I was very, very tempted to do what usually I do, and that is make each one of these basically a week of teaching. And the Lord said, no, there are other things I want you to cover. I want you to cover this, but I want you to do this in a shorter manner, manner of time. So we got nine things done in one Sunday. Those of you who have been around for a while know that that's just really <laughs> new pastor, okay? New pastor. I'm just being obedient. I'm, I'm, I'm being obedient here and following the Lord in this. But um, we're, we're just hitting the highlights here. We're not going in as in-depth as I would normally, normally do on this study. And especially when we get to the gifts and the distribution of gifts and things like that. There's, uh, as I said at the uh, end of last week, <clears throat> there's much that I have to say on this, okay? But I'm going to be filtered in, in what I'm allowed to say. So, Romans 8, 26 and 27. Romans 8, 26 and 27. If you're not, I think everybody here is comfortable with the Bible, but if you're not, that's page 966 in the Pew Bible. That's what that number is for, okay? But anyway, Romans 8, 26, 27 says, In the same way the Spirit also helps our weakness. Anybody want to say amen? Okay, the presence of God inside you ought to make you less weak. Very much so. Let me just say, the presence of God inside you ought to make you less weak. You shouldn't be leaning on the weaknesses that you had before you were saved if the Holy Spirit's inside you. You ought to be a new species and a new creature in Christ. You can't go back and say, well, you know, I've always been that way. That's just a demonic cop-out. It is. You're not really believing the salvation message. 
you're not really grabbing onto the truth of the salvation message. Now, I'm not saying you're not saved. I'm just saying you're not grabbing onto the truth of it, okay? You're not enjoying it. <laughs> Yep. You're not enjoying the benefits of it. In the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings that are too deep for words. Let's just stop there. Have you ever been hurting so bad that you just didn't have words? Have you ever had a, a death in your family where you just didn't want to talk about it? You didn't want people coming around patting you on the back saying, it's okay, they're in a better place. You just didn't want that right now. You hurt there has been something ripped out of your life. And no one in the world can understand that at that moment. No one can understand it. There is a time and period for grief. Oh, yeah. Grieving is okay. Hurting is okay. As long as it is, it is a place that you are passing through in your journey. And not a place where you decide to camp and make house. That's the difference. Yes, we should hurt. Yes, we should grieve. If you're not, you just, you're not understanding. These people are, are, are gone. And, and, and again, sometimes, though, how many of you know people that grieve and you know they hated that person and just crying like crazy? And they never got along and they're kind of doing it for show. The world expects that. They expect that of us sometimes. God doesn't. God doesn't expect that. The Holy Spirit inside me doesn't say grieve for somebody you didn't get along with. I can hurt for their loss. And maybe I wish I would have been better at reconciliation with them. Maybe I should have tried a little harder while they were alive. And we talked about Tom a couple of weeks ago at the men's prayer breakfast. He, he, he went around and, and he didn't hit everybody, but that was on purpose. He wasn't hitting everybody. The people that he talks to and knows pretty well, he kind of skipped because they know his heart. But Tom said, I'm afraid I'm going to die someday and there's going to be a whole bunch of people I didn't say goodbye to. So he's saying goodbye to people now. He's going up to people and saying, I just want to say goodbye. And they go, one guy asked him, Tom, you're not thinking about hurting yourself, are you? And he said, no, 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 no. I'm incredibly excited about life. But I don't want my life to pass without you knowing what you've meant to me. That's a great thought, isn't it? So he went around the room and just kind of gave blessings to everybody. It's what we call just blessing your heart. Just blessing you with a word. Just saying thank you for you. How many people do we kind of have in our lives that we could do that with? How many people should we be calling and saying, you know, we haven't talked in months. We haven't talked in years. Let's bury this. Let's get it behind us. Let's stop this foolishness. Can we? You know, I believe you're going to be in heaven. I believe I'm going to be in heaven. Let's start the fellowship now, not there. Let's start it here now. Let's put this behind us. So this whole thing of, of, of hurting and groaning and moaning, and, and sometimes you just don't know what to say. You just don't have the words. Lord, I've prayed this a billion times for my child. And they've still not returned to you. And I've prayed it and prayed it and prayed it. And I feel, I feel almost like a stupid hypocrite just saying it one more time. Lord, I, I don't have any fresh words for you. But my heart's still broken. I'm still broken. Will, will, you, just, will you just put it into words for me? Will you just put it into meaning for me? Now be very careful. Don't ask the Holy Spirit to take a message to God. Because he is God, okay? When you start asking the Holy Spirit and angels to take messages, you're real close to asking Mary to help you out, okay? You're really, really close to having this intercession. Listen, it doesn't say that he is our intercessor. It says he intercedes through us, with us. The Holy Spirit inside me can pray what my words can't. The Holy Spirit inside me can pray and bring me the comfort that I need in this time. So anyway... But the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings that are too deep for words. In our world, in our logical Greek-Roman world, we don't do a lot of this. We just don't. It's not manly to groan. It's not manly to moan. It's not manly to grieve. And, and women will, will grieve, but it's, again, we're so logical. We're so driven by the Western logic of the Greeks and the Romans that it's not logical to be that emotional. Have you ever watched a video of the Middle East when somebody dies? 
wailing and screaming and yelling. And, I mean, that's from like Italy over, right? When you get to Italy in that area, you start getting all this emotionalism. Really, really emotional in what they do. And we look at them from the West and go, oh my God, how unsophisticated. Yeah. How very, very gauche of them to be so emotional. Get a grip, lady. <laughs> Grabbeth thyself and stoppeth, is our view, you know? Because we are so logical and so Marlboro man and let's go west and win the world that we've left emotion behind a lot of time. And if you don't believe that, just let somebody get emotional at church and see how uncomfortable everybody gets. Just see how uncomfortable we get and go, oh, they're so emotional, aren't they? Why don't they go to another church where they do that craziness? <laughs> yeah. You see, we have, a, we have a spirit. We have a soul. We have a body. And that soul is our emotions. How many of you know God wants your emotions? And He wants to use them. So we don't really have that emotionalism unless we go to one of those churches, one of them holy roller churches. Oh, they're just all emotions. And I, I'll tell you, I'm, you know, I've served in some of those churches. And there was more emotion than there was brain a lot of time, okay? Sometimes their theology was a lot more emotion than it was scripture. And your pastor many, many times had many, many discussions with the leadership about, that's all well and good, but where's it here? Where, where's what you're doing here? You know, and... and you notice I'm not at that church anymore. But <laughs> but I can't help be emotional during the worship. I can't help it. Be, and I don't want to help it. I want Him to take my mind and my body and my soul. And I want to worship Him. I want to dance like David danced before the ark. David didn't do that as an exercise of faith. David did it because he couldn't help anything else but. The presence of God was returning to its rightful place, the temple, and his joy overflowed, and he was like a soda pop can that had been overshook. And when he opened it, he just sprayed out all over everybody. And he took his robe off, and he threw his crown to the crowd, and he took his tunic off, and he laid it in the street, and he kicked his sandals off, and he got down to his underwear. And that's all he could do is say, God, all of me wants all of you. Amen. To be so moved in my prayer time, to be so moved in my study and my my Bible study time to weep and cry over the love of God for me rather than saying it's another verse I read I know that verse thank you so much another check mark yeah. I'm very Western and very Roman and very Greek and I've read another I, do you know how many times I've read the Bible I've read the Bible seven billion hundred thousand times <laughs> I, I've read every word that many times did did it say anything to you what do you mean <laughs> did it change you what do you mean? Has it made your life better? What do you mean? Has your Bible study changed your life? Has your worship changed your life? Has your adoration of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and the Creator of the entire universe who chose you yes. as His child, has it changed you? Hallelujah. And so the Holy Spirit gets a bad rap of being all emotional, holy rollerish, because you see, the visiting God isn't the same as the indwelling God. Right. And so some of us have been raised in churches that gave us an Old Testament experience when we're under a New Testament. There you go. There you go. And we still want to go to the church and have a church experience because that's the tabernacle and you have to enter it in a certain way and a certain attitude and they're not dressed right and they don't have the right shoes on and they're behaving extremely, extremely weirdnesses. No, 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 no. We live under the testament of the Pentecost where people thought they were drunk 
at nine in the morning. Right. Folks, that's emotion and passion. Amen. Now again, we don't embrace the excess. We don't embrace the, the incorrectness of it. But some of us are just rejecting the whole thing because it's outside of our comfort wagon. It's outside my comfort wagon. You can't be raised on the Baptist or Mennonite or Lutheran and not have a little problem with emotionalism. You cannot. But that doesn't mean they were right and the Holy Spirit was wrong. It means the evolving person is to change. We are to be changed to the likeness of Christ. And most of us think that Jesus was the Jesus of the cinema where he walked around and walked in slow motion. <laughs> Jesus walked in slow motion and raised his hand very slowly and said, Brother, first of all, we all know Jesus had an English accent because of the movies. Brother, dost thou not understand the scriptures and the law of this day? Dost thou not see who's standing before thee? <laughs> Jesus was a construction worker. Yes, he was. He's a construction worker. Don't yes, don't paint him any other different than that. He was a construction worker. He worked with heavy stone and he worked with wood. He was a mason. He was a chipper of stone. We call him a carpenter today because that's what we think of. But there weren't enough trees to make houses out of wood. Everything was made out of stone. So he chipped stone and he had muscles and he had calluses. <laughs> you ever been around a job site where you try and speak the King James English? <laughs> hey thou brother, how dost the thoweth? It is good as us to see a thoweth. That's not going to work, is it? Nope. Now, we don't have to be one of them in dirty jokes and vulgarity and cussing. Correct. But we don't have to be King James either. Correct. Amen. Jesus laughed. Jesus was sarcastic. Jesus told jokes. Jesus rolled up his sleeve and helped him go fishing. Amen. Jesus cooked food on the shore for him when they were tired. Mm -hmm. It was a man's man. It's a man's man who was alive and a part of the known world at that day. And there wasn't a person that said, oh, he's so churchy. No, they didn't. That was not anything that was said about Jesus, was it? He was so, he, he drinks with publicans and sinners. Well, that doesn't mean go out to a bar this afternoon so you can be Christian, okay? Right. Let's, let's keep balance here. That's not what we're saying. But he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Now again, be very careful. This is not him standing up there saying, Hey God, do you hear what they just said? Let me, inter let me interpret for you. I'm the translator, okay? Say it again, Steve. <laughs> Steve wants you to help, help with the Kellers and their shoulder, okay? What else? What He's praying for Dale to get a place right now, okay? I'm interceding. I'm in That's not what we're talking about. He's not the go-between. He's not the Mary up there saying, My son, sad. Don't make him an inner, a go-between. All he's saying is, I don't have to look towards the temple, pray towards the temple, and sacrifice towards the temple to get God's attention. Because that was the Old Testament. The Old Testament says, you've built me a home, and if you want to find me, that's where I'll be. Look towards me, and I will hear your prayer. You look and see if that's not the dedication of the temple. When he told Solomon, you look towards me, and I'll hear you. You run towards me, and I'll accept you. You habitate with me, and I will sanctuary with you. Now he says, I sanctuary among you all the time. He is interceding for you because he's dwelling inside you and he is telling you the Father's will without the sacrifice, without the holy day, and without going to the temple to do it. You've got a picnic lunch of God with you wherever you go. Amen. Amen. That's intercession. That's intercession. I don't have to go to Golden Corral and eat. i got the Holy Spirit in a the pocket. There you go. I just suddenly got a picture of one of those frozen things that you put in those pizza things that you throw in the microwave and eat. And hot pocket. Yeah, the Holy Spirit is not a hot pocket. He's a whole meal. He's a whole meal and I take him with him. 
He is the one who lets me live the life of Christ on earth. You see, the intercession goes two ways here. The first verse says, He intercedes for us. He helps us to do the godly thing, but He also tells us the God thing to do in verse 27. 26 is upward, 27 is downward. And if we see the two-way street here, then it's really hard for us to ignore the will of God and do our own thing. It ought to be real hard for us to do that. So let's read the verse again. Let's read it one more time and see if you don't see that. Again, if you don't see it, it's all right. That's all right. It's, uh, you know, uh, this is interpretive, but it's what I believe the Word says. In the same way the Spirit also helps our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit Himself will teach us, will step in between, become our mentor, become our helper. He will become that tutor that teaches us about praying. And when we can't, He will. When he can't, he will. That's really the interpretation 26. 27, he searches the hearts and knows the mind of the Spirit, is, what the mind of the Spirit is. We, the Father, knows that mind because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. You know the will of God because the Holy Spirit makes it known to you. When you say, Father, what do you want me to do? The Holy Spirit says, thanks for asking. Come on. When you say, Jesus, help me with this problem. I'm hurting right now, and I need your help. It's the Holy Spirit that steps up and says, let me show you how to do that. It is God. It is God in the steam form. It's God in the gas form, in the spirit form. Jesus was the ice. God is the water who brooded over the earth who brooded, who hovered over the deep, the water, the presence. All three have been present and shown themselves. The Father has shown himself in creation. The Son has shown himself when he walked on earth. And the Holy Spirit showed himself in the form of a dove and his tongues of fire. All three have them. Doves and tongues of fire are spiritual. Jesus was flesh. The Creator is the most important thing for the presence of man, and that's water. 80% of your being is God in creation. Let us make man in our own watery image. Just sit on that like a chicken egg and incubate it for a week or two. <laughs> Just think about that presence of God that is in every... Do you know what happens to a skin cell when it dehydrates? You get flaky skin. You get flaky, scratchy skin. And when that skin cell is full of water and moisture, it's alive. The presence of God is manifested in every cell of my being. Amen. And the Father came in the form of the Son who took on the flesh so that he could be tempted as I'm tempted in this body. And he sinned not. Amen. And he killed the flesh and buried it and was resurrected in newness of life in the Spirit, so that I could partake of the Spirit. For if I was still flesh, the Spirit could not indwell me. But now I am a new species and creature. I am a spiritual being. And the welcome mat for a spiritual presence has been laid out. And the Holy Spirit comes and says, Ah, I see a spiritual being. I can live there. Amen. Amen.